Hi, good afternoon everyone. First, I'd like to thank ACM for, first of all, hosting uh, the symposium. I think it's a fantastic way to facilitate cross-cultural interactions and discussion. And I'd also like to acknowledge the uh, Benjamin Gilman Award Program. Uh, without a Gilman Award, I would not have had the opportunity to study abroad. Now, my name is Tani Sasaki, and I am a third year studying at Knox College, a uh, double major in international relations and modern languages with French and Chinese. Now, in the fall of 2014, I had the amazing opportunity to study, actually under the STEAM program, program as Marina at Peking University in Beijing, China. And to start off the discussion, I'd like to present the idea of being a hyphenated American. Now, this is a term that myself and a few of my classmates came across when we were discussing how we identify as not only Americans, but individuals within an American society. And I, I think it's important to distinguish the two. So, for me, this would be in reference to being a Mexican-American or an Asian-American. And I think this highlights a very important fact that in doing this, we are isolating ourselves from being just a normal American or just a stereotypical American. And before I left for China, I thought this was awesome. I was so proud of being more than just American, right? Like, I eat pozole on Christmas, and I can use chopsticks because my family's Japanese. So we have all these different connections, and I was so proud of my cultural heritage and being able to talk about it and how I could present a different perspective to my friends and my family, now to my colleagues, right? So then I went to China, right? They finally called Zhongguo, Middle Kingdom, right? And I'm going to give you kind of an idea of the demographics that I was dealing with when I went to study there. So, first of all, over 90% of the Chinese population identifies as being Han Chinese. And the Han Chinese is, I guess, physical traits are largely what we stereotype Asian people to look like. So, dark black hair, paler skin a lot of the time, but not necessarily a smaller stature, a different shape for the face, the nose, and the eyes, right? And we also have to consider the history of foreign intervention in China, not only from the northern part, but from the east in Japan, and also from western countries like Portugal and the UK, right? And so what I think these have contributed to is this nationalistic movement that has kind of blossomed, and it's this idea of Chinese pride, being a part of the larger Chinese majority, right? And there's nothing wrong with that, being proud of your heritage. So. This has also led to what I'd like to talk about is the idea of the minority conflicts within China. So the Chinese government actually, so consider this, there's a 90% Han Chinese population. The rest of 10% is split up between about 55 minority groups within the country of China, which is a huge number and a very diverse population as you can imagine. So this has kind of resulted in a few problems, legally speaking, especially in the Xinjiang region, which has been most prominent, I think, on news sources, okay? So, where does this put me, right? This proud minority girl from America going to this country that prides itself on being homogenous and uh, you know, part of a larger society, right? And so when I went there, everyone thought I was Asian. Everyone thought I was Chinese, right? So I wasn't even American. And I was kind of upset, right? Like, why were my friends getting all this fun attention, right? Like, I'm doing this crazy immersion program too. How come I'm not getting recognized for this, right? Like, I'm crying. And <laughs> it's hard work. And, and I suddenly found myself wanting to be that stereotypical American, right? I wanted a really high nose and really big blue eyes and blonde hair, and I wanted to speak English perfectly. And it, there were instances where I would tell people, like, yes, I'm American. I'm from the United States. And they would respond, with, no, you're not. You can't be. That's, that's not how I see Americans on the media. Right? And I was, I was just shocked into this idea that how could I not be American, right? And in the U.S., I was isolating myself. It was more of a voluntary, voluntarily done, right? And that when someone else does it to me, it's really, really uncomfortable, obviously, right? With good reason, I think. And so I was embarrassed that I had to justify that I was American, right? that I had to continually explain that yes, my mom is Mexican, yes, my dad is Japanese, but I can still be American and still absolve all of these other traits, right? And this was really hard for me. It took a long time for me to get used to. And I think today this is still kind of an internal conflict that I'm trying to deal with. And so, like I said, it's how do I perceive myself? Am I an American? Do I want to be a member of these minority communities in the United States? 
And it was really interesting because this was kind of happening with, you know, with what was going on in Ferguson when I was in China. And from what I was able to hear from what wasn't exactly censored, it kind of parallels with the minority conflicts in the United States and minority conflicts in China. And um, I thought that was just how I see myself and how I want people to see my country and how I want people to see me as a minority in my country. Those are all just different factors to consider in addition to my crazy Chinese classes, right? <laughs> so I kind of had to step back as my time progressed in China and see what had I put myself into, right? And I had previously seen myself as a victim, right? Like how come these people are judging me for not being what they think should be American? But then I realized, you know, I went to this country on a completely different end of the world with a completely different history and cultural background and I had already formed expectations about them as well. So I was doing the exact same thing. And even in this presentation, I'm continually referring to the Americans as us and the Chinese as them, right? It's just this idea of categorizing that we as humans do naturally. So there's this whole perspective of the East versus the West. And a large part of my experience there was distinguishing between what is Western and what is modern, right? So I think as an American, I always considered that what we do is right and we do it the most efficient and the best and the most modern way possible, right? In French, they have a word called le mot pas du faux, right? French, of course, have a word for that. And um, <laughs> so I just put some examples up there. You know, the toilets, first of all, let me tell you, when you open a stall, there is no porcelain throne. That can scare the, you know, to go to the bathroom. And so then the idea of non-Western medicine, right? Chinese medicine, they've had it for thousands of years, and it works. Sometimes smells really bad and looks even worse, but it works, right? It doesn't mean it's not right, it's just not Western. And then finally, the system of right and burma. I mean, those crazy symbols, right? They use like over 3,000 average a day. Can you imagine? I just thought that was so inefficient. But then, you have to consider the history of China. Each symbol has a meaning. It represents something within Chinese culture, and that's beautiful, right? That's something I should recognize and not criticize because it's not like what I'm used to. So why does this whole crazy idea of self-identity even matter? Right? Like, what is the context in our society today, and for me? And I guess the most general phrase I can give to it is a more globalized point of view, right? And I think everyone in this room can agree that studying abroad is kind of like one of those things that when your mom tells you something's going to happen, and then you're like, no, mom, no, mom, and then it finally happens, and you're like, oh my god, she was right. So, you know, you go to a different country, and you're like, you come back, and you're like, oh my gosh, I have this reverse cold shock, I'm so much more cultured or I have this more perspective, right? So that's exactly what happened in China. I got a more globalized view of the world and how people see Americans, right? Just these multiple and diverse perspectives and everything. So I put up there that I'm more comfortable with who I am and who I want to be, but I don't really know if this is necessarily true. I still don't know who I want to be in the United States. I still don't know how I want other people to see me, but you know, I guess that's part of the whole learning experience. I'm going to continue to maybe have this conflict with for the rest of my life. And that may not necessarily be a bad thing, right? And finally, I think the message that I'd like you all to take from my presentation is the idea of being a hyphenated American or trying to isolate yourself from being a stereotypical American a good thing, right? Does this kind of represent the ideals that we'd like to establish as a society? That not being American is a good thing, but as a whole, we should all be American? Thank you.